Hello, and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in f uh, film, television, and in books. And today I am joined by Ian C. Esselmont, author of Orb, Scepter, Throne and the novels of the Malazan Empire. And we're going to have a chat about Orb, Scepter, Throne. Cameron, how are you doing today? Just great. Thank you, Rapey. Thanks for having me. Hello. <laughs> well, it, it's brilliant to have you back. I love uh, when we get a chance to to chat about these things and, and record the chat because obviously like we talk occasionally and, and we have chats about this stuff, but to be able to share it with other people is, is something that's just fantastic. And it's modern technology allows this. And believe it or not, that's a segue into one of the themes that I wanted to talk about, which is um, in the novels of the Malazan Empire, and in particularly uh, in Orb Scepter Throne that we're talking about today, there's this really fascinating investigation of uh, elements of the past, how it links to the structures that we have in the present, and where it can lead to in the future. And the difference between being locked into a retrospective and or nostalgic or locked into that past mode uh, where you become tradition bound for the sake of tradition versus learning from the past and moving to the future that these are all aspects of how we in as individuals as cultures relate to our histories and our culture's past and it was it's an aspect in these novels that i think you articulate the the pros and cons of of the approaches it's not clear cut one way is definitely uh, all good and the other way is definitely all bad there are pros and cons and attractions uh, to both so that's what i thought we would talk a little bit about today how do you feel about that well, that, that question, um, I think, spans most of what Steve and I were doing in, in the Malaz books. Uh, I think you could probably say in most of them, it's an issue. Uh, and uh, particularly, uh, yes, in Orb, Scepter, Throne. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, has, it has occurred in the, the previous novels of the Malazan Empire. Um, you know, it, we had, but in... Stonewielder, there was a focus more on uh, the evolution of religion and how the events of the past can be changed to create a religion that maybe is not truly reflective of those key events or it has been turned or changed in some way over time. There, there was an analysis of the passage of time and how legends and myths and religions are born and formed and changed over time. Like that, that was one of the key components of Stonewielder. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we were talking about um, ad cultural attitudes towards uh, legacy or past. Yeah. So, and that's, that's what I, I can see in all of these, that this is always an element that, that comes up that, even if it's not the major thrust of the novel, it is a, a linking theme through all of it, because I think in your work um, and, and in Erickson's, this awareness of the importance of the past permeates everything. Um, and, you know, may, maybe it is your training, you know, in, in archaeology and, you know, digging stuff up out of the ground. I think so. I think that definitely contributed to this... Uh... <laughs> obsession of uh, for, for he and I, uh, or or it's elevating as an important aspect to to explore in, through through fiction. Yeah. So with Orb Scepter Throne, I think if we lay out um, of the the major, let, let's start with the the sort of the the races, the peoples, the cultures, um, because there's there's clearly a big storyline with the Maranth and the Sagula and their ancient rivalry. Uh, we also have the Daru, because it's a lot of it's happening in Darugistan. We have the, the storyline with the Rivi, which is also, I think, thematically connected to a lot of this, even though you may disagree. I'm the critic, you're the <laughs> author, listen to me. Um, but surrounding all of it uh, is the input of the Malazans. And I, I think we can 
we can talk about these these interrelationships and and the different aspects it, in each of them because I think they articulate slightly different points. So I mean, let, let's start by talking about the the Maranth and the Segula. Um, so um, this is all spoiler, of course. Yeah. Um, so we have a uh, an ancient rivalry, um, MT uh, enemies, uh, who are um, in the past were, were uh, sort of set upon each other, uh, and. Uh, in in either case, the portions of that uh, ancient memory is lost. In others, it's um, misrepresented or becomes reinterpreted, uh, and, or becomes a, um, a sort of a fixed point of of their culture that they just can't get beyond. Yeah, because we see that in in a lot of um, bias and prejudices that. Uh, pervade various societies. It's, we hate those people. Why do we hate those people? We've always hated those people. But why have we always hated them? Well, we just have, because they're hateful. And it's this sort of, there's a circular logic to it that it's not connected to anything in the modern day. It's always linked to some far nebulous past where some wrong was done. And the, the sins of the father have consistently been inherited all the way down until people have actually forgotten the entire context of the original. And we're just left with this distrust between two segments of a population. So, you know, and fantasy has that ability to literalize that metaphor. Yeah, make actual real tribes, if you will. Uh, um, actually, impending tribes. Because, you know, one of the things I find fascinating about the, the Maranth and the Segula, in some respects, they are radically different. And yet, I think at their heart, they are very similar cultures, um, highly regimented, highly stratified caste societies with uh, isolationist tendencies, very formal structures uh, within them and through their organization, and a distrust of outsiders. We, we see that xenophobia in sort of both of them. And the, the Moranth, don't take their armor off when they're amongst the the norms, the normals, the plebeians, the the outsiders. The Segula don't take their masks off. They they are almost mirrors of each other. Like they are they are very similar in a lot of respects. They come out of a <clears throat> um, a, a sort of the same period back in the history of of this region. Yeah. Yeah, feel free to to build on any of this, Cameron. <laughs> I'm You're making, just making me do all the work for you. You go. I wrote the book. I'm making it so difficult for you. Yes. Uh. <laughs> but um, I mean, obviously, I mean, the the chitinous armor of the Moranth is is a, a source of endless speculation. Um, and I'm not going to ask you to divulge the secrets of the Moranth. There has to be some mystery left in the world. <laughs> But was that was that by design um, that the Moranth and the Segula were were almost like different halves of the same coin? No, I don't think it was a deliberate, um, sketched out, you know, bullet point, you know, sort of thing. I think it just sort of developed organically out of the the cultural contentions that we were um, playing with. At least I hope, and and it's my I hope that it, it they it sort of came to fit. Uh, just the way that it developed, because it wasn't, um, I'd like to think that it wasn't forced on the material. Uh, and Well, it, it feels very natural as it is explored in the novels. Um, and I think, you know, part of that m might be due to both yourself and Erickson and, and your friends when when you were gaming these and designing them and playing them, a lot of the the rough edges of things that you could drop into a fantasy world, a lot of those rough edges get knocked off and smoothed out as that segment becomes more integrated into the reality through the familiarity you develop through exploring it from the different lenses of the players and the, the GMs. So, I, you know, I think that's a tremendous advantage that both you and Erickson had um, in creating the setting. It's um, 
more fully realized and integrated than a lot of the fantasy settings that we see because you had many minds and perspectives helping to shape it. And then once it was shaped, that's when you began the narratives for for the books. Hmm. Just, and the, the gaming itself, just doing that, I, I think um, really helped uh, I, both of us. Um, and, and I said, I think we've discussed elsewhere uh, yeah. in terms of narrative and character development and respect for the, um, <clears throat> the setting and what's being set up and um, but it, I, I, just as a digression, did did you ever game like uh, any of the player characters as them as a Marinth, or were they always NPCs? You know, I think they were always NPCs, uh, and they showed up later. I think it was mostly Steve and I. Um, a lot of the stuff at this mm -hmm. point was, was mostly he and I. Um, that uh, what were, were, we didn't sit down with uh, the other guys for this that was my what i brought i think my gang of friends um and i sort of dragged steve into that uh, and he was there f uh, for a few times uh and then after we s left winnipeg then it was he and i mm -hmm. yeah but um so to, to return to what we were meant to be discussing <laughs> so the, the cultural <laughs> legacy the, the cultural legacy of it because Yes, we have this ancient rivalry, this ancient hatred between the two, but where the Segala have overly specialized in the sword and that very particular martial tradition. Um, and I saw in, like I saw in that, probably because I am, I, I'm unfamiliar with other forms of it, but a lot of the samurai tradition, um, the perfection of the sword as an art and in contrast to that you had the Maranth realizing well we're never going to beat them that way we need to find something to beat them so they had the the raising of the the quarrels so that they could have flying units uh, the messing around with alchemy to create the explosives um but neither neither culture seems to have much in the way of magic. Yeah, it's not a, their strengths. Um, and um, it's there, but they chose to pursue other tools and put their time and resources and intellect to other purposes. And that's, you know, that's a fascinating thing because in the Malazan world, so much of it is those little hints that magic can be accessed by anyone if they have the training and yes you will always have some people who will be adept some people who will be natural talents but if you can find someone to train you um you, you might uh, be able to access at least some level of magic and yet here we have these two peoples that have completely turned their back on that even though they know it exists in the rest of the world well given the the um revealed genesis of the uh, Segula, uh, it could be argued that there is some channeling of that magic into their supernatural almost uh, abilities with their chosen you know, weapon. You could argue that that's why they are just so good. That's where they're putting all their energy. And that there might be a touch of, the, of uh, uh, a racial ability there. And, you know, and certainly that would make sense with a lot of these things where someone is a natural talent and they may unconsciously be channeling their Warren. And for the Segula, the way that their minds work, the, the focus that they have in their society, it would be channeled into that martial ability, the perfection of form. So, I mean, that, that's actually like a really cool idea. Thanks, Cam. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> And the, the Segula, as we see, also, I'm sorry, the Moranth, um, they chose alchemy. Uh, and it's other people have done it as well, of course. Uh, in Calor, for example, is um, one of the main examples. Uh, he found himself just, it wasn't, he just wasn't good at it, right? It just, you know, uh, some people can't hammer a nail. It's just, no, it doesn't work. 
So he went the alchemy route uh, and has um, pursued that to, to almost, uh, you know, its greatest mastery. Right, because he's, he's essentially immortal through alchemy. Um, and like the whole idea of the, was it the century candles that you, he burns one candle in the night and it gives him a hundred years worth of life. Like that's a, that's a pretty powerful and potent magic. Um, and yet we don't think of it almost as magic in this because alchemy, we tend to separate out as some form of sort of science, whereas magic is more of an art. Uh, it's a strange separation. Maybe you don't, but it's a strange separation that I have in my mind. Um, uh, I think, I don't know, I can't exactly speak for C, but I think we approach it more like uh, an issue of chemistry, right? Which has its traditional uh, interpretation as either alchemy or as, a, you know, it's more of a science chemistry. Uh, and these two traditions in, in using this and, and uh, in ex explaining the manifestations of, of these uh, characteristics. Yeah. So what, what I was getting at with the, the Maranth and the Segula is they are both bound by, in some respects, this ancient past that they cannot seemingly escape from. Um, for the Segula, it is, it's very much the focus of their entire culture. With the Maranth, we see that they have done things to beat the Segula, and yet, and you would think they are then forward thinking because the idea of a breeding program for the quarrel, the idea of researching all of the different alchemies to, to create and refine the munitions, that seems very forward thinking and progressive. And yet when it comes to that crunch moment in Darugistan, when the Segula are essentially defeated, the tyrant has been brought down and you have the Segula and the Moranth facing off against each other and the Moranth are like, yeah, well, well now we're going to march to our deaths if they don't put down their swords. And the Segula are going, but well, we're not going to put down our swords, even though we're basically defeated, we're going to carry on killing you. But they cannot escape that. So even the Moranth, who I, in some respects, do seem forward thinking are locked into that tradition. Um, I think you can uh, just look around. You can see uh, societies that remain un unnamed that are might be forward looking technologically, but are retrograde socially. So. <laughs> and I bet without there's a whole lot of people without pointing fingers. <laughs> I, but the thing is, there are going to be a whole lot of people watching this going, oh, he's talking about X. And I bet if we pulled in the comments, you, you could name a whole lot of different countries where that would apply. Because this is not about one specific culture. This, this is a problem that a lot of different cultures have. And problem. we all have it to a different, to a greater or a lesser extent, that in some respects we look to the future. But in other respects, we are bound to our past. And sometimes we're blind to that distinction, I think. Um, oh, yeah. Because certainly the, the Segula seem very blind to their actual past. And that, you know, that's a significant plot point in this. They didn't remember the tyrant. They didn't remember their actual role. And they didn't remember that they essentially fled. It had in their mind been turned into they'd been sent into exile and that this was their return whereas they'd actually escaped. Um, so, I mean, it, it's fascinating. And when you have that moment where Jan and the third and, and the, the rest of the, the top 10 of the Agati are, are kind of looking at Dasim and they're trying to decide who's going to be the new first. And Jan comes to the realization that he can't do it because he is still too locked into that mindset. And he realizes that the rest of the Agati are too locked into that mindset, that the only one who could actually bring them to a new future that respects their past, but also will give them a new horizon to aim for is going to be Dasim. But he wanted, 
there's no way he can just let Dasim has it have it. So there, there's that whole confrontation he has with the third, where he orchestrates his own death in order to psychologically break the third to show him the truth of that argument. And, you know that that's a very emotionally powerful moment. Well, I hope so. I mean, he knew he had to take those tests, but it had to be done in a way that was acceptable to his, you know, people. Uh, and so he, he had to stay within certain boundaries. He couldn't couldn't make the break too overtly. And and, it, yeah. and I think that ties into you can you can see a way forward, but you can't change an entire culture overnight in a ninety degree angle. It it you can want it to go that way. It still takes time to to move the iceberg or to to steer the glacier in another yeah. direction. And like Jan's sacrifice in that moment uh, was very powerful to me because it was a, a recognition of not necessarily almost a failure of leadership. But he could see the bright future. He just knew he wasn't the right person for it. And so an enormous self-sacrifice, an enormous sacrifice, an incredibly honorable sacrifice, and the sacrifice of the self for the benefit of his people. You know, and that is something that is so, so positive, and yet it was only made necessary because of the situation. And it feels like such a tragedy. Because... So, yeah... That's the one of the definitions of <laughs> tragedy. Uh, yeah, uh, that um, single um, flaw that is part of the, the character that either leads to or causes or it necessitates that sacrifice or death or what have you. Yeah. Um, and, but that, that tragedy then is obviously the spur for why the rest of them accept Dasim. Because it, it's in that moment, that, that revelation of this truth that they couldn't see before. And now they can see it. So it, that, that moment was very, very powerful in the novel for me. Um, and I think it has a lot of resonance for like, some of the issues that we have in today's world. Um, because I think we, we all long for leadership that is willing to sacrifice itself for the good of the people. Like we long for those types of leaders. The right kind, yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, we don't necessarily have them everywhere. Um, but that conflict between the two of them, it's interesting that the Malazans are set up as the way forward. And it's not necessarily that the Malazans are set up as heroic. It's more their their pragmatism, because everything we've seen about the Malazan Empire is tinged in various shades of grey. Like we're we're not seeing the Malazans through rose tinted glasses here. They are not necessarily heroic and good, but what we've seen is a very utilitarian pragmatism. There, um, I mean, not that we are endorsing imperialism, uh, but at least they are uh, a co they're a cosmopolitan, very accepting of, of uh, differences in others, uh, and which uh, is their strength. Uh, and uh, they can um, bring uh, a different perspective to uh, a, a situation that has been static, let's say, or unchanged and, and or stuck, as you would say, stuck. Mm. That's not really the way to say it. But um, age old uh, feuds that uh, just simply cannot be resolved by either party. It would take a third party uh, or some sort of change, a, a re equilibrium. Um, and that's what they bring. Um, and that's out of their own past, their uh, own bloody, terrible, uh, continual warfare of their in, in their own region. Yeah, and well, I I, I don't think anyone can see uh, 
either the novels of the Malazan Empire or the Malazan Book of the Fallen as a celebration of imperialism, <laughs> given, given the not. atrocities committed by the empire, given the decisions that get made and the lives that are wasted. And um, because we see a wonderful counterpoint or a wonderful different way of looking at it in the Rivi, because we have there for generations, they've been led by Caledon Brood, who is essentially an immortal god leading them. And he was the, the warlord. And in this book, we have the Rivi reject him because he's now pursuing peace. He's now pursuing a way of life that would actually benefit the Rivi, that would um, secure them, give them safety and still allow them to follow their their own tribal paths, their their own traditions. And the Rivi reject this with very short sightedness um, because they see themselves as powerful and they, their opponent, the Malazans, are weak. Darugistan is ever everyone around them is weak. They can take back this power. And instead of seeing the long view, the way that Caledon Brood does, because I think he phrases it as, but you would go into these negotiations in a position of strength and that would give you a much better peace deal with everything going on, that you, you can dictate a lot of the terms. And they say, well, why should we do that when we can wipe them all out and then have everything? And it's, it's a very short-sighted, um, zero-sum way of approaching it. Instead of everybody winning, they're willing to gamble on let's kill all of them and then we'll just take everything. And what we see is when they run into the, the Segula, who are now the servants of the tyrant, they realize their mistake because Caledon Brood had given them a way out, had given them a way that would have secured them. And now thousands of them die in a senseless battle that needn't have happened. Um, so again, we have that, the pride in the past, the pride of being a, a warrior, overriding the pragmatic sense about what they could do for their future. Or an inability to, to think of uh, options and even consider them as uh, viable. You know, that, that sort of rigidity uh, and blindness to, to um, options. It's very commonplace. Yeah, so, the, but that's why I saw them as kind of being another articulation of this point. And then when we link it to the Daru themselves, the Daru have completely forgotten their past, uh, except in the form of, you know, they, no one uses white except for the funerals, that uh, white, that white stone was associated with death. That's all that they remember of the tyrants. They have forgotten everything. Um, it's now knowledge associated with arcane scholarship that Baruch and Mamet would have engaged in. And then we find out why Baruch and Mamet were interested <laughs> in this sort of thing, because they happened to be around at the time. They were there. Yeah, they're, they're actually suppressing it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's this wonderful inversion, whereas in Gardens of the Moon, you know, Mamet is, oh, I'm, I'm a scholar investigating this. You go, no, you're not. You're just looking over your diary. <laughs> um, but then like the, the past coming back here, because we have that moment with, um, is it Eben, the, the scholar, the archeologist, mm -hmm. um, Writing yourself into the novel, are we, Cameron? <laughs> oh, it's uh, maybe uh, there's there's lots of uh, scholars out there, <laughs> um, but it just so happened that uh, you know he he was an archaeologist who was digging up tombs. <laughs> some some wish fulfillment, perhaps. I I I only hope I could have been doing that. <laughs> um, it's, but is that the dream that archaeologists have, that one day they'll be out looking at something and go, oh my God, I found Atlantis. <laughs> well, to have been vindicated, let's say, uh, by um, finding something significant. Because what I loved about that was that was someone involved in the study of the past. 
And, you know, we've just talked about these people who were locked into the past, who had that, were tradition bound for the sake of being tradition bound. And here we have someone deliberately digging into the past, quite literally, to try and discover more about it, but not because they are tradition bound, but they want to learn from it. And that was something that I find, you know, is very admirable to me, at least this search for knowledge and to, to seek to understand, um, which I saw as very, very different to the tradition bound aspects, because it's, it was about knowledge, not a uh, replication of, of tradition for tradition's sake. Yeah, those are the, the, the two approaches to, um, <clears throat> to the tradition as, a, as an, uh, a body of knowledge. There is uh, replication and re-inscription -re and repetition you know, versus inquiry and uh, actual critical analysis and that sort of thing. There's those two, two different approaches there. And yet, this critical approach, this investigation, this search for knowledge is the thing that releases the tyrant. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, do, do not go there, you know, thou shalt not. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's, yes, I mean, it can happen. Uh, and that doesn't have to be an actual um, tyrant as a character, but uh, and, uh, revelations that are uh, unwelcome, let's say. Um, and that it, it works then as that, that, again, the literalization of that metaphor of having a cultural identity that you're invested in, that you believe in, and then some damn fool archaeologist comes along or some historian and they dig into sources and they find this evidence and go all of that is based on a lie it was actually this thing and it can be devastating in much the same way that the the segula have their culture broken by the revelation of who the tyrant was and who they were um that can be devastating to to a culture in our world to find out that everything you've believed is a lie because either then you double down on the lie and perform those gymnastics in your brain because otherwise you have to admit that you were wrong and you have wronged people based on that. That's a very difficult position for, for us to be in. Yeah, it's a very difficult challenge. Um, so I liked how that was worked in. And again, it's, it's disguised in that, that literalized metaphor. But it ties into that theme and it works its way so neatly into everything else that you're exploring. So I thought it was really well integrated into those other storylines that they all meshed really well to to support one another in these different readings. Well, the the, the peoples and their the, the the crisis that the, the various cultures in the region find themselves in. It's a it's a common confrontation and uh, crisis of identity yeah and then the uh, the sort of the last one that i wanted to bring up in in relation to this was the the opposite of what eben was doing which is the whole uh moonspawn storyline where it's oh look an an ancient site we now have access to shall we study it Shall we investigate it to find out all about this culture of the T Standy? <laughs> shall shall we, you know, make etchings and, and paintings based on it or rubbings of the, the No, let's loot it. Let's run down there, we'll strip it of everything that it is worth. And that gold rush mentality. Um very much would you say it's a commentary on the on the old <laughs> 19th century tomb raiders sorry um there's, archaeologists yeah yeah there's something of that that's for sure uh the older tradition that uh a discipline let's hope matured from uh that 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 older mentality our our schleman moments uh oh, look charles i have found all of these sculptures they're going to look lovely let's bring them back to the museum uh, yeah. We won't leave them for these savages. Sure, they'll just go to waste. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a, a lovely example. The Elgin marbles, of course, is, is the sort of um, picture 
boy, you know, bad boy for this this um, uh, traditional approach for the of uh, finding antiquities and uh, saving them, saving them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It, or stealing them. Uh, you know, it's one or the other. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. But. But what was interesting here is obviously like Eben, as the scholar, is scrabbling around going, I need money to pay for things and can someone give me funding? And then the other way of doing it is, yeah, let's go and steal everything from the tomb and, and sell it. And, and the, the commercial aspect, that, that tension you have between academic inquiry and the need for a commercial product because why is someone going to you know pay you to do something and and let you have you know enough food to survive if they don't have a product at the end of it and, and for me it was it was a wonderful articulation of that tension in scholarship <laughs> yeah uh well you could say you know what scholarship on the other side of it but uh... <laughs> <laughs> well well, you know, take things to extremes. Um, but actually, like thinking about Moonspawn, that was a setting that I um, I greatly enjoyed the exploration of because it had been so mysterious to that point, um, almost always viewed at a distance. And in fact, I think there's there's only one major scene in the Malazan Book of the Fallen that's actually set in Moonspawn. But even then, uh, Erickson's quite sparse with the descriptions of of what's in there. Whereas here, we actually get to dungeon crawl our way up through it. Um, a Monty Hall dungeon party with no interest in looting. D talk about subverting tropes, Cameron. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. It was fun to go back to my roots. Uh, <laughs> uh. But worst quest group ever. They leave so much loot on the ground. Like that party deserved to fail. <laughs> we, they, they, <laughs> oh yeah, we was, it was having so much fun with the, uh, the, the characters themselves that the, the rest of that just fell aside and fell to the wayside. Um, but <laughs> when I, when I was reading that, I was reminded so much of those those early fantasy stories that, that were very heavily based on like the, the RPG sort of system of going into a dungeon, killing everything and stealing anything that wasn't nailed down. Oh, look, a pewter candlestick. That'll go for two copper. Into the backpack it goes. You know, um, I remember like a lot of those sort of dungeon crawl games and you'd set up that whole thing so well like anyone familiar with role-playing games the sort of the shanty town that's developed where you can buy all your adventuring supplies before you go to the ancient tomb that you're now going to go and loot <laughs> mm -hmm. well um this is returned to um later as well but so maybe i'll jump the gun a little bit and then really you're right it's it's the gold rush it's and that's not something that's you know just comes out of the um, contingencies of uh, role playing. Yeah. Uh, it's it's historical fact of how these rushes developed their stages, and um, that the merchants themselves are always the ones who come out on top in the end. Uh, they're the ones who actually make any uh, make fortunes, uh, and the actual poor buggers who show up to dig. Uh, rarely come away with anything. Because um, I, I know you, we won't get into the, any of the details of it, but I know it is a, a significant plot point in a seal. Um, and I think you make it more explicit in a seal. Um, because it's fine. I mean, the, if you think of what happened in um, California, in the West Coast of America, but particularly in Alaska, uh, obviously where you are, like the remnants of that in Alaska are still very, very visible. And even now with modern technology and, and big excavation equipment, but going out into the Alaskan wilderness to stake a claim and, and rip up and uh, gouge out the countryside searching for gold and pa uh, 
modern day panning for gold, but with quite sophisticated and large plant and machinery. Mm -hmm. it, it's still um, ongoing. Again, uh, uh, we're not so far from our past. Uh, it, it has not gone away. It's still here. That um, sort of uh, approach of uh, exploitation and uh, there's um, ongoing proposals to, to you know, uh, for mines in uh, critical habitats that are still being considered. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a hard lesson. Uh, <laughs> um, and again, it, we, we don't seem to learn from the lessons of the past. Uh, it, it's, it's this ignorance of, of the bad of the past, almost looking at the, with nostalgia, because if we think of all of those narratives, the, the, uh, the films depicting the Wild West and the, the gold rush, and it was the jaunty tune on the player piano, and it was, hey, barkeep, two fingers awry, and, you know, they, um, uh, the ladies in colourful outfits, ladies of negotiable virtue, shall we say. And, you know, it, it's been mythologised and sanitised and even the depictions of violence in a lot of those Wild West movies are not uh, as gruesome or as brutal as perhaps the reality was. That I think, I think we've forgotten that aspect oh, yeah. of it. And, that, and that's uh, just the human aspect of it and we can you know go into this in more perhaps more detail with a sale if, if we get ever get to that point yeah. um but if you look at period photos uh say from um mining operations of, of the 1800s uh, and it's, it's a moonscape the the countryside's just blasted and wasted and there's just blackened stumps standing here or there uh and all that wood has been gathered up and burned for, uh, you know, for the industrial processing. Uh, and it, there's nothing's left. It's, it's a, looks like a bomb has gone off. And, and of course, you know, one of the, the natural consequences of a lot of this was desertification, um, entire water, watersheds disappearing because we, we no longer had the, the canopy cover and that, that slow soakage of a lot of the water to slow it all down. So uh, mudslides, everything. And it just, it was this snowballing effect of one, well, I was going to say one small change, one massive environmental disaster, essentially, but one the massive, cascade effect. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and this intervention that, that just disrupts everything uh, and, and entire people's being usurped and uh, ways of life being um, rendered almost impossible. Uh, and it's, again, it's that, that um, an encounter that was um, crushing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that one, I think, when we get to a sale. But um, with, with Moonspawn, the setting itself, that exploration of it um, was particularly satisfying because it was both alien and beautiful. It was was haunting and strange, uh, an element of the sort of the gothic sublime, where in particular the the scene where they're walking through the carved forest, and it was hauntingly beautiful. This idea of all of the trees shaped out of stone and the the jewels on it but everything in blackness, everything in, in darkness because of elemental night. Um, hauntingly beautiful and unsettling. Uh, so a, it, little, a little nod there to Gardens of the Moon. Uh, well, <laughs> again, which, literalizing it somewhat, Cameron. Which happens again and again, uh, I hope, and little, little things. And, um, that are, are little stories about uh, the, the gardens of the moon. Uh, and of course, you have that direct reference to Apsalara, the, the goddess of thieves, um, and her story. It, but in creating that, I mean, if we think we, we had the Wild West sort of shanty town on the shore, we have that very Gothic seeming um, interior to Moonspot. Uh, Darugisan again is very evocative of 
I'm trying to think of where where I think Darugistan sort of feels like, and I think there are elements, probably because of Raiders of the Lost Ark, there are elements of that uh, almost a, a Middle Eastern style of city to, to Darugistan, but I'm not sure that's accurate. It might just be my brain doing that. Yeah, I can't really, again, I can't really say exactly for Steve, but I think we both saw it the same way. We both sort of saw it as very Byzantine, very Byzantine, you know, like right there, uh, straddling two regions, uh, across roads, uh, uh, an open cosmopolitan city. Actually, yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but those different um, almost urban settings, uh, or at least uh, enclosed settings. Very, very different in the novel, ha evoke a very different feel and atmosphere. And then, of course, you have that, uh, the scenes happening in the plains, um, which, you know, evoke the, the sense of the prairies of, of Canada. Uh, where where did steps. you, yeah, or the steps, but, uh, you know, prairies of Canada, where, where would you get that inspiration from? <laughs> My God, yeah. <laughs> I thought I left that behind. Oh no. <laughs> no but um, my my spin as a as a as a prairie boy is is um too much uh, longing for the sea, perhaps uh, too much rom romanticizing of of uh, the the waterfront. <laughs> Which is why there's so many bloody ships. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But, and even then in this book, you know, set in the interior, we have on the coast going out to, uh, to Moonspawn, and then we have the shores of creation. You couldn't resist oh. putting in a strange sea somewhere. Um, and the, the shores of creation are fascinating. Uh, is there anything that you, rather than me try and describe all of this stuff, why don't you talk a little bit about the shores of creation? as as a sort of concept mm -hmm. um not on the world of course uh, another realm um and the idea of the, the the greek idea of the eternal flux of chaos and cosmos of uh, creation and destruction uh and uh the the, the eternal need to uh, renew <clears throat> and you have a force that's constantly eroding and just destroying uh, versus a, a counterforce that's trying to, to um, bring order to matter. So it's not void. It, there is, there's a material there, which I just, we call Viter. Uh, and uh, it can be either, it can be um, unformed and, and uh, chaotic, or it can be made into order, it can be rigidified. And these two forces are constantly at war here. Um, because it, that wonderful, the, the movement in the Malazan story world between physical realities and metaphysical realities, and it's a mere transition through some sort of portal or gate or, or dream, but uh, all of the characters treat them as equally real. It's not, um, I, and I think that's something that I find quite rewarding and, and nice about it is when the characters enter a warren, they don't go, oh, this isn't real anymore. This isn't the real world. It's no, we are now in a warren. This is another real world. And they, their expectation of it is as real. And some, somewhere like the, the shores of creation, which is such a, a metaphysical concept and very, very abstract. And yet they still regard it as uh, while strange and magical, it is real. It, they don't sort of look at it and go, oh, we're, we're suddenly standing in a very abstract notion. And they treat it as real. And it's that, it, to describe it as seriousness, and it, this is something I struggle with. Um, they aren't flippant about it. They uh, aren't snide about it. And I, I find that refreshing. Um, I would like to think that um, they're the, the, they're willing to entertain the idea that it's not really that dis distant. Uh, if you could somehow drill down far enough 
into the earth and go down and down, down to the foundations, you would find yourself there at these shores of creation. And they're willing to sort of entertain that notion uh, that it is not distinct from their reality. Um, and it, it, I mean, it's certainly not an area of expertise of mine, but there are certainly certain cultures on in our world where uh, the distinction between the dream world and the, the waking world is not as separate, say, as uh, the Western world would tend to dictate. Uh, the one is one is dream and not real, and the other is uh, physical and therefore real. That metaphysical realities can interlie our own, and it's it's all part and parcel of the overall reality in which we inhabit. Um, yes, it's real. Uh, the the entertainment of the, the mythological is something that I think we're sort of moved on, on from. We like to think, uh, but uh, it's something that's just as real to other peoples. Um, and that I mean, it was that's why. I was saying I liked that it was treated with an element of respect in it rather than being dismissed. That it, it's it's another way of encountering these concepts and trying to wrap our brains around them, um, using literature as a way to think about the world from a different perspective, um, which I, I quite enjoyed. Uh, so we've seen, obviously in, in, in all of this, the character at the center of the shores of creation is, is Tatrin. Obviously, one of my favorite characters. <laughs> is, is he Tashrin? Yeah, that's the question. And and again, I go notions of the physical reality of someone, the spiritual reality of someone, notions of what consciousness is. Are we the same person one moment after another? All of these are questions that get posed and answered in in various different ways. And I know I've mentioned like literalizing metaphors a couple of times now, but that's, I think, what we see with Tashrin. Tashrin falling into or being taken up into the, the rift in Return of the Crimson Guard. And then the being that used to be Tashrin standing on the shores of creation somehow that has access to Tashrin's memories eventually, but access to a different set of memories. And we have this conversation then about, is he actually Tashrin? What does it mean to be the person? Are we the sum of our memories? What happens when you have amnesia and you have a whole load of other memories? Are you a different person now? Um, and a lot of that gets suggested in his, in his exchanges with Kiska. Yeah, the um, <clears throat> re recapitulation of the self, uh, moment to moment, uh, I, I think is uh, one truth uh, that, it, that can be looked at and, and isn't, isn't talked about too much. Uh, but there are other ways of viewing uh, the self. Well, it ties into the argument that I always make about, uh, you know, you as an author 10 years ago when you wrote this, you were a different person to how you are now because there isn't a single cell in your body that is the same. Not a single apparently, cell. Apparently I'm dead. The, 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 <laughs> the author is dead. It's, apparently <laughs> I'm a mass murderer. I have killed all of these authors. Uh, <laughs> but not a single cell in your body is the same. So physically, you're an entirely different person. Um, mentally, a whole note of new neurological connections have, have sprung up, old ones have, have disappeared. So mentally, you're a different person. You have different priorities. You're at a different stage in life. You have different experiences. So that, your personality, while it shares some similarities, has also changed. So how are you in any way the same person as wrote this book? And you can choose, um, or you, you maybe you can't, but you have the option, the possibility of choice. You know, and maybe we... Uh, are living in an illusion of choice, uh, which is one argument, but uh, rebirth, renewal offers an opportunity and you can make of it what you choose. Yeah, so essentially you're a walking ship of Theseus. <laughs> um, but with, with Tashrin and his journey, 
and his decision then of taking the the old personality and memories of Taishan and the the new what's the name of the the character on the shores of creation it's Therun. um i think it was a long was title, it Thinage? the the thor the yeah thir- Thinage, i think Thinage. Or, yeah but so Taishan, that memories and personality Thinage as the the newly formed um, almost an innocent um living in this this different space with a different set of criteria and when both become aware of the other uh because of kiska's actions there's a decision do you, does he become tashran again and destroy and subsume thanage does he remain thanage and destroy and subsume tashran and what we see is perhaps the most difficult choice which is no it's both and i have to find a way to integrate these very different personalities to become the new person i have to learn from my mistakes and move on and grow and this is of course you know something we are challenged with uh, in our actual lives um to move on and learn and accept those things into ourselves as and acknowledge them as part of ourselves our mistakes are part of us and he chooses that path which is more difficult um and further than that then taking that newly formed personality deciding that he cannot remain separate from everything that's going on on the malazan plane of existence returning and merging with krull or cruel and cruel. Cruel. yeah and he could he of course was no stranger to this at, at, by this point <laughs> um and so i like i find that fascinating because it is it was difficult for me to wrap my head around the concept of personalities coming together and then the idea that a third personality is formed that is actually both of them so the person that walks out of that room and he says call me Turen so the artist formerly known as Tashran um is also uh Kurul Kurul um that is Kurul as well as it is Tashran and in that moment is kind of both because I get the sense that he has absorbed all of what Karul is into himself in the same way that we saw on the shores of creation, that merging of those two aspects. He's done the same thing here. Mm-hmm. So Karul, in some respects, is still alive, is still immortal, is still that god, but now has an aspect of Tashrin merged into them. Or is it Tashrin who has the aspect of Karul merged into them, or is it an entirely new entity? And that's the kind of mind bending thing that makes me think about what our consciousness is and and how we learn from our our past. Yeah, and and uh, the choices that we make, <clears throat> how how we you know are are you know they always talk about the language is is sort of very loose this way like moving on. Or, you know, like, what are you moving from and what are you moving towards? <laughs> Phrases like that, uh, that, that suggest that transition of, uh, of self. Um, so, so how, how did, why was this such a, an important part for this story? Um, and fitting in with what's going on with the tyrant? Because uh, Tashrin and uh, Turan really have nothing to do with the tyrant line and that entire uh plot line Turen isn't involved in that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. uh no you're right there there's no direct dualism that's being put up here um the uh, shores of creation and corral that is part of a, a much larger arc that is you could argue is over the entire set of books like all the books steve's and mine uh, which is the um, the crippled god, 
Mm -hmm. And he, so that's part of, of that meta narrative. Um, because this is uh, of, of all of your books. Um, I think this is the only one that I feel it has certain aspects that are dependent on one of Erickson's books. Um, I don't think any of the other books are dependent on uh, any of the books of the Malazan Book of the Fallen. But there are a couple of minor points which have importance to your narrative that acquire a lot of their context from the Malazan Book of the Fallen, in particular Toll the Hounds. Uh, and one of them is uh, the Shards of Dragnapur. Uh, that Krupp uses to forge the crossbow bolts. Um, why Dasim's facing off against Yan, but how Yan's duel with the third is actually uh, thematically, symbolically, and resonant of Dasim's uh, duel with Rick. That this is one of the few times when one of Erickson's books, I think, provides a lot of resonance and, and context and connection for one of your books. I think they always work well in conversation with each other. But those two points in particular, um, I think, gain a lot more significance when you've read Toll the Hounds. Yeah, Troll Hounds is very much a sister volume to Orb Scepter Throne. They really speak to each other. Uh, and uh but i i would like to think that there are lots of these points because we're sharing the world of course and we're using each other's characters and and picking up plot points from each other whereas as each of us pick them up and put them down uh and, and i hope you know i know there are a couple missteps and maybe some uh uh that timeline that, doesn't matter inconsistencies creep in but you know well we're doing our best here we've got lots of balls in the air and <laughs> yeah you know but what I would say, I mean, it's, I think the two series work in conversation with each other. But this is the first time I've ever felt that there are moments where I went, because it's been a long time since I've read Toll the Hounds. And I was going, I know, I know them from somewhere. And I couldn't quite place them because it had been so long since I'd read Toll the Hounds. Whereas I didn't feel that with any of the other books because while I would say about 95% of Orb Scepter Throne works absolutely perfectly as a novel on its own, they're uh, raced uh, having the, the card game in the Azath House. That is something that has a direct point in, of connection with Toll the Hounds. Uh, the shards of Dragnapur. Um, those elements needed Toll the Hounds. Um, the resonance of Jan's duel with the third. I mean, I spoke about how powerful it was. I spoke that, uh, I, I talked about the emotional resonance of it, but it gains additional resonance when you remember it's being witnessed by, uh, by Dasim and Dasim had had to go through the same thing with Rick. And um, so we see that echo of exactly the same thing. Um, and it it adds a, a an additional dimension to that particular scene, if you're aware of Toll the Hounds. But well, yeah, you I mean, it's all about um, trying to add resonances and trying to trying to thicken the, the weave uh, and, you know, doing what you can to try to try and achieve that. Uh, and 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 make that moment touch on all you know multiple levels, uh, and um, I don't you know I think you could say that about a lot of what's going on though because it's uh, there are things that are referenced in Toll that are referenced in Orb Scepter Throne and and etc. and all, even all the prior prior standing novels. Yeah, I mean, that's why they the books are always in conversation with each other because you share characters, you share plot threads, you it's a shared world and a shared history. Uh, of course, there are always these points of connection. Um, 
but this this was the first time I, I went oh i know them from somewhere where do i know them from i went i haven't reread told the hounds recently <laughs> <laughs> uh and yet and yet uh, you, you scorch and left uh, scorch and left how did where did scorch and left come from they're from steve oh of course it's his fault <laughs> Uh, I think, I think, I don't know if originally they were his, I'm not sure if like character wise, but I think he might have um, uh, banged them together uh, and uh, then I picked them up. Because I think you two have a fondness for those slightly absurd characters who bumble their way through these momentous events and come out unscathed on the other side. I think that's what we all are, you know, us humans. I think that's what we are. We're just bumbling along and fumbling our way through history and hoping it all turns out right at the end. <laughs> oh, we, we are the scorch and laugh. Oh, God. Yeah, I mean, that's Stephen R. commentary on um, all of the vaunted plans that so many have. <laughs> um but one one last person i wanted to talk about so you have krupp in orb scepter throne and krupp is uh quintessentially one of steve's characters and yet you have him here he he's realized on the page you made him a lot creepier than I remembered. <laughs> Maybe he's not, you know, I, I took a shot at him. Uh, and uh, that's a very tough character. Uh, I was very trepidatious about tackling Krupp. And I spoke to Steve quite a bit about it. And, and he said, you know, no matter, just whatever, it's, it's he's yours now, do what, do what you will. Uh, and we, that's how we do, how we approach this for, for each of us. Uh, and uh, so, while I knew he wasn't going to be Steve's crop, uh, I wanted him to be true to the character as revealed to, to that point. Yeah. And that's, uh, I think, and I think this actually comes down to the gaming. I think Steve has a fondness for that character, for crop, because he played him and he was this exaggerated. And I think Steve has a fondness for that. And you remember that annoying character that Steve <laughs> used to play that would drive you insane. Yeah, and yeah. so it's it's that slightly different perspective of him, I think. Maybe. <laughs> but what I find fascinating, there were inklings in Steve's ver uh, version of Krupp, of Krupp being a lot more powerful um of potentially being frighteningly powerful but it was hidden behind that veneer uh his projection of the uh the cherubic um non-threatening crumb covered crop and it was a deliberate act on his part and because of the actions in this we actually i think you give us a glimpse deeper into the danger and the power inherent in krupp about how he can almost so easily manipulate events and all of those things that were signaled in erickson's work you pick up on here and you give us that other perspective of him to show to show it in not quite so uh, a beneficial light. He is still a good character. He's still acting on the side of good. But I think he's he's a lot scarier in your book. Hmm. So the, the, <clears throat> the curtain comes a bit askew, does it? With, um, uh, I, I allow a bit more of a, a glimpse of Krupp, the, the, the machinations that uh, perhaps... Um, and no, it's I, and I think it's something that both you and Erickson do very, very well, and and how you play off each other, because you both show us slightly different views of a character. 
we actually can create a more three-dimensional understanding of that character. Hmm. Um, whereas, you know, in a single author work with a single narrative perspective on a character, that is the light that you always see them in. But here, because you are two different minds, you have two different memories, and you have two different views of the character, a lot of the essence of that character gets revealed just in those subtle differences or in the 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 aspects of it that you choose to highlight and the ones that you you choose to um, de-emphasize. So, for instance, Krupp, Krupp's use of illusion and his manipulation of people. Because we see it from the effect, other people recognizing the effect, and we know it was Krupp did it, we realize how, quite how creepy and powerful that is. Whereas Steve always had a, like one of the scenes, I think, was like him walking through the market and using his magic to steal little pastries and dainties to feed himself and hide in his pockets for later. It's a, it's a much more innocent and a slightly comedic version of it. But here we see when the chips are down and Darugistan needed him, Krupp is willing to do these things that are actually quite Machiavellian. And he he doesn't hesitate to use people. And he can use them quite harshly. Um, even if he chooses to, to, like he does choose to reward them. He is, he is a benevolent imp. You might not have, have seen that in, in Toll or in other Steve's works with Krupp. Uh, but yes, he's always been the eel uh, and the, the kingpin uh, uh, <laughs> um, and the, the, the force behind the scenes always uh, trying to manipulate. And uh, I think that the exigencies of Orb, Scepter, Throne pushes that forward more because there's really quite a climax that, uh, that and there's no more time for subtlety. <laughs> And, and this is the thing, all of those elements are there in, in Erickson's version of the character. You know, it's, it's not like this is a different character. It, it's exactly the same character, but it suddenly it gave me that different perspective on it to recontextualize what I had seen in Erickson's books and go, yeah, all that is actually there. I just was, was giving Krupp the benefit of the doubt or glossing over the potentially negative aspects of it and suddenly now it's it's additional insight it's not that it's a different ver or a, a flawed variant it it's additional insight giving me greater insight into the character um i think that's what i was trying to get at mm. yeah yeah uh, yeah as you said the different a different perspective uh, <laughs> you know yeah. He looks different. He, he, he looks different. That's because we're looking at him from a different perspective. Uh, and that's, you saw him externally and uh, as that irritating character that Steve played. And Steve was going, I'm going to annoy Cam. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just to, to finally return to, to what we were meant to be talking about, about uh, these aspects of, of the past, I think the the moment where it really comes to the fore is that the change in warfare um, that we see. The Moranth munitions being the heavy artillery of the Malazan world being unleashed on the the officer gentlemen of the Segula. Yeah, uh, they're in charge of the light brigade. Yes. Um, and I see that moment and and I think of how you use that so brilliantly to show the what we see in the, the mechanization of warfare and the evolution of warfare in our own world. That here, here we're seeing it one step removed to give us that psychic distance, to give us that way of, of kind of appreciating it um, in, in a way that allows us to take a, a, a step back and, and look at it from the different angles. And we've also seen how magic can be used in that way. And I think these are the, uh, the aspects in the Malazan world that articulate this potential downside to progress. That progress and education and 
forward momentum can have a cost. And what we see in the Moranth carpet bombing, um, what we see in the use of magic to destroy shows, I think, that that literalization of this, this issue that we have in our own world. Uh, invention is not always beneficial. Mm -hmm. The uh, industrialization and mechanization of, of uh, warfare and violence, um, and it's becoming ever more efficacy, the efficacy of means of destruction just growing and growing. Uh, and that, yeah, and that's all handmaiden to uh, you know, progress or scientific uh, investigation. Um, yeah. And certainly, I mean, it's no stranger in, in fantasy, because obviously the scarring of the Shire was was Tolkien's uh, literalization yeah. of that and his exploration yeah. of it and his fear. Um, we see it in, in a far more beneficial light in stuff like H.G. Wells, where um, the land ironclads actually basically praises the evolution of the mechanization of warfare as a way to do away with the, the corrupt nobility um, and free the urban proletariat from the, the power of a, of a corrupt ruling class. Um, and it, it's fascinating how we have these different articulations of exactly the same point, again, depending on narrative perspective and the perspective of history. Yeah, di different explorations you know, and coming out of different historical situations. Uh, but these are all just uh, uh, aversions and explorations. Yeah. yeah. So I feel that you've just had to be sitting here listening to me, Cam. I invited you on to talk. And every time I, I try to talk, you're like, yeah, OK, yeah, no, that's that's our point. Carry on with the next one. <laughs> I so hope I, not, not quite that bad. But... <laughs> well, no, it's I know. I'm going to get criticized for not letting you talk. And well, I've had my say. The book is my say. This is your chance to. You don't have a, a responding volume out there. This is your volume. <laughs> but I want to give you the opportunity. Like this is your opportunity to to talk about the book, about um, about these aspects that why you felt they needed to be explored why why you actually not why they needed to be explored why you felt the drive to explore them in this way um well one thing um uh for steve and i is that i, I we felt the fantasy could be used in this way uh you know it's not to critique other authors and, and their approaches but we saw something that we thought that you know we weren't we weren't particularly seeing focused upon uh, and we thought the fantasy would, it could work very well. It's something that could add depth uh, to, to uh, the work. Uh, and we could do more than sort of just tell, you know, entertaining stories. Uh, but we could use the, um, the genre uh, and, and infuse uh, ideas from the uh, intellectual traditions that, that we've been trained in and use it to explore those. And that's what leads to these, this um, preoccupation, I think, with the past and uses of the past and the, the pros and cons of focusing on tradition and uh, societies that are flexible and forward looking versus societies that are um, rigid and uh, holding on to, to traditions and even in the face of when they are no longer um, helpful. Uh, it, societies that are uh, open to change or not or as it, these are just different cultural approaches to dealing with something that uh, um, I think is inevitable which is change and how do you how, how do you deal with it how do you grapple with it it's threat it's both threatening and an opportunity it's yeah it's what's the old expression the uh, mutability is the only constant <laughs> um and yeah, I mean, I th I think that is one of the strengths that both you and, and Erickson bring is that real sense of history to the world. And I think it is it is part of your training and, and how you perceive um, our world has infused that, that points of, of time 
are connected. Uh, we see like Tolkien built like a very complex mythology, but you don't in reading the Lord of the Rings, um, a lot of that mythology is not necessarily connected. Um, the Silmarillion exists, the, uh, the Unfinished Tales and the Histories of Middle-earth. There are all of these extant volumes. But when you read the Lord of the Rings and there's the sense of, oh, you know, look at this statue. These are, uh, it's the Argonath and these were the, the former kings of Gondor. You know, it, it feels not necessarily artificial, but not quite as integrated into that reality because it's more mythic. It has a mythic resonance. Whereas, to my mind, and, and certainly to my feeling, the Malazan world has the feeling of a reality, um, that it is more uh, concrete and solid, that these, these world, this world existed and lived that history. And I don't get quite the same feeling from Tolkien, because Tolkien to me is much more myth and legend and slightly nebulous um whereas i i feel that sense of history permeating the malazan world i hope so um <clears throat> these are all older critiques of of the genre of, of mythology uh, of fantasy that it's just you know separate and uh is painting pretty pictures uh and is ahistorical uh, and all of those sort of critiques, and 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 this is maybe now this no longer a debate, but but back in the day, <laughs> oh, <laughs> these oh, are Cameron. things that Steve and I were responding to. I know, but even today, we still have that dismissal of the genre. No matter, no matter how many examples that we can give of powerful, uh, intelligent, um, stunning works of fantasy. They are either uh, singled out as exceptions and the rest of the genre ridiculed, or they are ignored as part of the genre. And that, that still happens today. It is still something that bugs me today. But I think, I think there is a slow, slow change <laughs> to start accepting more of a, a serious treatment of the fantastic and what fantasy can do and has done like we we have exceptionally important fantastic works um of which i would i would number you and uh you and steve's works um oh, yeah. but we, we still uh, have I've that today that. there's so many authors who are using the genre to to uh, examine you know serious cultural and social issues uh, just as you know mainstream literature is doing these are the, the same issues are being examined uh, but using different tools right? yeah um and of course i mean uh, science fiction has been been fighting the good fight in that arena yeah. as well yeah. um horror horror exploring uh like the depths of of human fears and psychology and aspects of that aspect of the human condition. Like all, all of these are different ways of approaching um, and exploring our minds, our consciousness, uh, our histories, uh, our hopes and our fears. Um, it's literature, that, I suppose that's what it comes down to. It's all bloody literature, can we just move on? <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. if, if there is nothing further that you would like to discuss here, um, do you have anything pressing that you you want to raise that I've I've failed to mention? Well, I think we've done a done a fine job for now. I imagine that um, tomorrow I'll think of twenty more things. <laughs> but, uh, as of now, great. Thank you so much for this opportunity and this uh, platform. Well, as ever, Cameron, it is an absolute pleasure and delight to talk to you. Um, and. You know, I'm looking forward to to Blood and Bone and a Seal because I think uh, even more so than than Orb Scepter Throne, uh, there are important aspects to both those novels that I think uh, it'd be great to have you weigh in on. So if you don't mind, when when we get to those, that if you could come back and we could have a chat about those. 
I, I think so, because I personally, I mean, I just my own view of those, uh, those two, I think that's where I really r rolled up my sleeves and, and went for it. Uh, these, all these things we've been talking about, I, I think I really went all in um, on those. Um, so thank you very much. And for, uh, for those of you still watching, thank you so much for watching. And I will see you in the next one.